right, let's, let's move on, because uh, today I really have a, another, a different message. And uh, it's, uh, today, today, every so often I, I use the phrase spinach message, because uh, some messages are more fun for me than others, and some messages, like, just like, you know, mom or dad, you don't give kids pizza and uh, ice cream all the time, right? Sometimes they got to eat spinach, because what's the best thing for them? <laughs> the spinach, right? And so every so often I give, uh, I use the phrase spinach message, and, and it's just my way of saying fasten your seatbelt, because sometimes the messages that are best for you are hard on the flesh. <laughs> right, okay. And, and this one is, but it's also the most radical weight uh, freeing thing. Uh, so it, the title is What to Heal, What to Crucify. And it's kind of, uh, I'm, I'm continuing on a theme I started last week a little bit, and, and even a few weeks before that, talking about um, healing from rejection, right? And uh, started a few weeks back with the idea of the Achilles heel of rejection. You might remember that one. And I've and, uh, just been talking about that idea that, that rejection is like Satan's number one weapon to destroy people, right? Get that idea into them that you're unloved, low self-worth, you don't matter, you know, that kind of thing. And if he gets that lie, you know, that stronghold into you, um, it's, it can control you your whole life. Um, it can be healed. Amen? It absolutely can be healed. And we've been talking about that a little bit. Um, and last week, uh, kind of went into Luke 3. Let's, let's go to, I'll explain the title in a few minutes. But let's go to Luke 3, uh, verse 4 and 5. This was last week, and I'll just give you the five-minute review before we kind of build on it. Uh, quoting from uh, the book of Isaiah, it says, As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness... Make the way of, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. That's John the Baptist, right? John the Baptist is going to prepare the way of the Lord, announce the Messiah, make his path straight. Every valley will be filled, every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough ways smooth. And really what he was talking about was there, um, the custom or the tradition at that time, if a king was going to come into a city, right, they would go and make sure and prepare the road before him, fill the potholes and, you know, bring down any bumps in the road and, and straighten out the road so that the king doesn't ride in to town on a road going, <laughs> the king rides in on a smooth road, right? and it's dignified and, you know, you get the idea. So John the Baptist was going to prepare the road for Jesus, right, but we weren't talking about a physical road, we're talking about our hearts and our souls. And he said, valleys will be filled. And really, he's talking, he's really talking about the road here. Potholes will be filled. Right? And uh, mountains and hills brought low, the bumps and brought low. The crooked will be made straight and the rough ways smooth. When last week made the point, the crooked being made straight, uh, John the Baptist was referring to the tax collectors. And he said, stop overcharging people, stop cheating people. That's crooked be straight, right? And he was talking to the, to the, the, the he said the, uh, the rough ways will be made smooth, and he was talking to the soldiers, right? And he said, stop intimidating people, stop using your power, you know, um, in an abusive way over people that don't have power, right? Make the rough ways smooth. And then he said, every valley will be filled and every mountain and hill brought low. And we know that um, the mountain to be brought low and the hill to be brought low, he was referring to the religious leaders who had a lot of pride, they had a lot of religious pride going on, right? And uh, he said to them something like, don't, don't, don't think that because you're children of Abraham that, that you've got it made just because of that. He said God could turn rocks into Jews if he wanted to, <laughs> right? So, don't, you know, you're the chosen people, yeah, but how did you get that way? Totally by grace. What did you do to deserve it? Nothing, right? Lower your religious pride. And then he also spoke to the common people and said, if you have two tunics, share it with him who have none. If you have food, share it with him who has none. And the idea of that was filling up the low places, the potholes, but it was about a lack of love. If there's a lack of love, God will fill it up, right? And then you'll be someone who ministers to other people. Associated with that idea, the lack of love, was the idea then uh, connected to it of a lack of self-worth, a lack of value, you know, sense of value. Because if you're unloved, you come to believe that you have no value. Right? You, you associate yourself as a person who is rejected, unloved, unwanted, and without value. And so when, what, what Jesus wants to do when he gets a hold of your life, he will straighten out what's crooked, won't he? And he will, he will smooth out what's rough, won't he? He does that, and, and it hurts, doesn't it? I, I use the example Friday night with the youth group, like when God gets a hold of your life, sometimes we're like a wrinkled old garment, and he throws you on the ironing board and heats up the iron and starts, you know, <laughs> right? starts going to work on you. Let's iron out the wrinkles, and you're going, ah, you know. Why does he do that? Because uh, there's an old saying, God loves you just the way you are, 
but he loves you way too much to leave you that way. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So he says, let me get a hold of you. I'll change you. Yes, I'm going to iron. I'm going to put you on the ironing board and, <laughs> you know, we'll start working out the stuff. And it hurts, doesn't it? It does. It does. But why does he do that? He loves you. He loves you. He's not going to leave you a mess. He's going to fix you. And, and uh, anyway, but he also, when he gets a hold of you, he's going to bring down mountains and he's going to fill up potholes, right? So if there's pride in your life, he's going to tear it down. Hallelujah. And if there's um, lack of love and low self-worth in your life, he's going to fill it up, right? So in a healthy way, you know who you are, you know you're loved, you know you're valued, right? And you're full of his love and you also have a humble heart. Right there is that beautiful place of spiritual, emotional health, right there, right? Uh, talked about it a little bit last week. Uh, and uh, let's also talk just for a minute about... Um, the value of sozo ministry again because we do you know i emphasize sozo ministry here uh we offer it we have trained teams that are very very good uh we also have every year we do you know encounters retreats and it's all designed to help people with these issues you know particularly the rejection woundedness issue a lot of people come into the body of christ wounded and rejected don't they enormous huge 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 and we believe in healing uh, Jesus let's I'll give you two two verses on this Luke 4 18 uh, this is Jesus mission statement right when he when he uh, began his ministry he quoted this from Isaiah the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor he has sent me to what is that <laughs> heal the brokenhearted can you really heal the brokenhearted yes Yes, 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 you really can. I know I've, it's, he's done it for me. And also, Psalm 147, verse 2 and 3, says something very similar. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. Uh, he gathers together the outcasts of Israel. Of course, that, applied, that applies to all of us now, right? We're God's people. And, uh, and uh, it says, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. What, is, what, was, what was verse 2? If you go back to that one a second. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers together the outcasts. What does outcast mean? The rejected. The rejected. The ones that don't feel that they're valued, that they don't feel they belong, they're wounded, they don't fit in, right? And, and he, he, God, he gathers you to his heart and says, let me heal you, right? And then verse 3 tells you, what does he do? He gathers you together close to his heart. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. And I believe that a big part of Christian ministry is healing the brokenhearted and binding up their wounds, right? Because lots of people come in with woundedness. Lots of people come in with rejection issues. And, and it hurts God's heart, and He wants to heal that. He wants to take you into His arms and, and absolutely heal that. And, and we do that in uh, one of the things, one of the ways that we do that is sozo ministry, one of God's many ways of touching people. And what's, what's powerful about sozo ministry, if you haven't been through it, or if you have, is uh, sozo ministry, it's not psychology and it's not counseling per se. Uh, sozo ministry uh, goes after the spiritual dimension of man, not just the mental or physical, right? And usually in secular, at least in secular psychology, um, they don't acknowledge the spiritual part of man, the spiritual dimension of man. So if you're, if you're missing a third of the whole human being, spirit, soul, and body, if you're missing a whole third of the human being, how, how, how good are your results going to be? Mm -hmm. So sozo ministry, right, goes after, understands the spiritual dimension of man, goes after that to heal that. Sozo ministry also focuses on the power of forgiveness because Jesus taught forgiveness, right? He taught that forgiveness is a way to get healed and a way to get free and a way to agree with his heart. And again, a lot of secular psychology, at least, does not acknowledge or focus on forgiveness as a, as a tool, um, really at all. And it's in, when, but from Jesus' teaching, it's absolutely huge key to, uh, to healing and, and forgiveness and uh, freedom. Uh, also, uh, Sozo Ministry focuses on the supernatural healing power of Jesus, as we see in these verses. Can you really heal a broken heart? Yes. Yes, you really can. Jesus can. Right? And... Uh, then other thing sozo ministry has is the power of repentance, which is we look at things now because victims always become victimizers, right? The, the abused always become abusers. There's these chains that happen. And so you can also take ownership of basically that sin, right? And confess it and bring it to God in repentance. And God can, can heal and set free and change and transform. And we also in sozo ministry, we acknowledge the power of deliverance from evil spirits. Because uh, if you're, if, uh, I know this is a 
just a sad thought, but if you're, if you're already wounded and rejected in a deep way, you know what happens? You become a magnet for demons. It's true. How does that happen? Because devils are bullies. They're like flies to a wound. They really are, right? And when you're carrying around deep woundedness, in yourself that doesn't get healed, doesn't get healed, doesn't get healed. You're actually a magnet for demonic oppression. Ah! Important to get healed, huh? <laughs> it really, really is important to get healed because devils are bullies and they bring all kinds of extra baggage after that because um, you're already weak, you're already broken down. And so Sozo Ministry acknowledges the power of deliverance from evil spirits, which generally sec secular psychology does not. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Sozo Ministry also understands and uses the power of truth biblical truth, right, which uh, changes your mind, renews your mind, and transforms you. So we use Sozo Ministry to get people healed, uh, and, uh, and it's a very, very powerful, powerful tool. However, it's not the entire picture, <laughs> because I've also seen people go through Sozo Ministry. I've seen many people go through Sozo Ministry and be very, very healed, very transformed or at least at, at bare minimum get really good breakthroughs you know get unstuck and start growing and really start you know it, it helps it helps but I've also seen sometimes social ministry really somebody goes through it and uh, and come out the other side and they're pretty much unchanged okay like, eh, I'll try something else now you know and, and, and I'd see that happen once in a while and I think why you know why and and I started to watch you know when that would happen and uh, and, and a lot of times, and I, I, got, I got kind of the picture of why a lot of times that happens anyway. Maybe not every time, but a lot of times why. And it's the other side of the picture, and it was the title of the message. Some things you heal, and some things you have to kill. <laughs> okay, <laughs> right? <laughs> and it's very, very biblical, and I'll show you. <laughs> right? let's, let's look at Luke chapter 9, verse 23 and 24. Right? We looked at this verse last week also. I want to do a review it and build on it a little bit more because Jesus said he heals the brokenhearted some things he heal right but there's some things that have to be killed you don't heal them you kill them <laughs> right and what's he talking about well first read Luke 9 23 24 again Jesus said to those who had, were starting to follow him if anyone desires to come after me let him do what <laughs> deny yourself take up your cross daily and follow me and 24, I think, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever, desire, whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. And he's talking about the, the natural life, right? And the natural life that we have where we tend to have our ego on the throne, our self on the throne, our pride on the throne, our ego on the throne, where we're in charge, I'm in charge of my life. And uh, yeah, and he says, if you, if, you, if you feel the need to save that, you lose it all. But if you surrender that, you gain it all. <laughs> That's pretty radical, isn't it? It's very, very radical. It really is. Go back to verse 23. What is he? What was he saying again? Remember, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Deny himself means there's a part of you that you say no, right? So I mean, if you know your simple thing, if you're on a diet, you know, and the cookies are calling, chocolate chip cookies, here I am, come and eat me. Big glass of milk, 10 or 12 cookies, mm, you know, and denying yourself means you go, no, <laughs> right? That's what it means, right? And, but here what he's talking about is pride, ego, self, right? And pride, ego, and self says, I want to be in charge. I want to run the show. It's all about me. And you have to go, no, <laughs> right? It's not. And then he says, take up your cross and follow me. And again, you know, Jesus had not yet gone to the cross, had he? They didn't know he was going to go to the cross. The cross, all they knew about the cross in Israel is that's how the Romans execute criminals in the most humiliating, disgraceful, torturous way. That's how Romans execute criminals. That's all they know. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. If you see somebody walking at that time, you know, in the Roman Empire, if you see somebody walking down the road carrying a cross and some guards around them, guess what? There's going to be an execution. You're carrying your own cross to your own execution. You're the star of the show. You're going to die, right? So when he says, take up your cross, follow me, it means you're going to die, right? <laughs> And he says, take your cross daily. You're going to die. <laughs> right? Ooh. What's he talking about? Pride, ego, 
self. When I mean self, by the way, I have to define self so you know what I'm talking about. I, I'm not saying that your self is bad or evil. Guess what? If you're born again Christian, you're, you're not evil, right? You're, you're, you're a child of God. You have a new spirit. You're right, born of God's spirit. Um, but what he's talking about, that self, is the old Adam nature. When Adam and Eve fell, sinned, right, their, their nature changed into selfish, right, and prideful and dark. It just got, you know, it became um, about self on the throne, self on the throne. In fact, we read it last week. Remember the story in Isaiah 14 when Lucifer became Satan, right? It says that he, this angel that God created, he said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the Most High. I will, right? He's five times he said, I will be like God in one way or another. And, and that, that nature of pride, and that nature of I'm going to be in control and I'm going to run the show and it's all about me, right? That was satanic nature. That's when he became, Lucifer became Satan, the enemy, became the devil, right? And that nature, when Adam and Eve sinned, that nature came into Adam and Eve their spirit also, and they became prideful and it's all about me, right? That's the definition of sin, by the way. Sin isn't just, well, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not, you know, commit adultery. That's, those are symptoms. Those are, those are symptoms or fruits on the tree. The actual root of sin is, it's all about me. I do what I want. I'm in charge. My pride, my ego, it's me. I get to do what I want. Nobody tells me nothing, right? That's the nature of sin. That's what happened when Adam and Eve sinned. And when, when I talk about self, that's what I'm talking about, is that, that old fallen human nature that still says, I want to run the show, right? It's pride and ego, okay? So when Jesus is talking about this, he said, deny your cross, take up, or deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. He's saying that pride, that ego, and that self, it's going to go to the cross. It's got to die. Some things you heal, some things you kill. And, and, when, when I've, and I've seen people that, that go through sozo or similar ministry and come out very, very unchanged sometimes. And one of the common factors very often is pride, pride in place. And you can't heal pride. Sozo ministry is all about healing, but you can't heal pride. You have to kill it. Kill it, kill it dead. <laughs> And, and that's what Jesus said. In fact, in this, in this verse, remember, he said, if you don't take up your cross and follow me, um, you can't be my disciple. He said that in, 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 later on in the same book. If you, do, if you don't take up your cross and follow me, you cannot be my, my disciple. Can you be a Christian? Can you go to heaven? Yes. The moment you call on Jesus, the Bible says, you are declared righteous, justified, saved, Spirit of God comes and lives in your heart, you're a child of God. But can you still, as a Christian, still be full of pride and ego? Yes. Yes. Does it happen? Yes. <laughs> Happens. And here's a really surprising thing. I mentioned it last week, but I want to mention it again a little stronger, is that, um, and what I've seen in over 30 years of preaching, and I, and I knew it was true in my own life, is you can have deep rejection, deep woundedness, and at the very same time have pride and ego issues. How do those two things go together? They do. <laughs> deep rejection, deep woundedness, pride, and arrogance, and ego. Both in place at the same time, kind of partnering and protecting each other. And they're a horrible combination. And they make you and everybody else around you miserable. <laughs> if you have those things in place. Very dangerous stuff. Uh, I'll, I'll describe a little bit more here. But uh, basically, Jesus said, if you really want to be free, you want to be my disciple, take up your cross. And let's see what, yeah, what does that mean? Also look at Galatians uh, 2.20. Up here. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Yea, Jesus loves me, gave himself for me. And the Bible says also that when he died on the cross, he did not just die for you, but that he died as you, right? And, and when you come to Christ and, you're, and you, you belong to Jesus, the Bible says that God sees Christ's death as your death. 
He will literally, God will say to you, oh yeah, you died on that cross back there. And you say, I did? And he said, yeah, you did. <laughs> right? You died on that cross. And when Jesus died, he died as you. He did it for you. He did it in your place. And when Jesus rose, you rose. And when Jesus ascended and seated at the right hand of the Father, you ascended, you seated at the right hand of the Father. Everything he did, he did for you. He did as you. The moment you come to Christ, it's all yours. Okay? And the very literal reality is when you get born again, your old spirit literally did die and disappear. And when the Bible says you get born again, you get born again. It's literal, it's real. You have a new spirit, a new heart, a new inside that is not the old fallen Adam nature. You have a new heart inside of you, right, that is a child of God. God breathed life into you. Your nature is love, holiness, goodness. That's your new nature inside, right? Well, if that's all true, and it is, why do we still struggle with stuff? We still struggle with stuff because the old Adam nature is still holding on up here. Our thoughts, our emotions, our memories, our flesh, it's still holding on there, right? And we struggle with that. Do we, anybody else struggle with that besides me? Or like, okay, all right, okay, good. So see, it's, yeah, and I do too, I do too. I'm the preacher. So <laughs> we all struggle with that, you know, that still wants to hold on, right? And that old Adam nature that still wants to hold on. It's not in your heart, but it's in your thoughts and your flesh and your, you know, it's still holding on there. And what it wants to do is, it wants to be pride and ego and say, I'm in charge, I'm in charge, I'm, right? And Jesus is saying, no, take up your cross. That's got to die. That's got to die. Some things you heal, some things you kill. <laughs> and so we have to understand that that pride and ego is an enemy. Eh? It's an enemy. And it will cause great failure in our lives, our Christian lives. It will cause great defeat and, and problems if we allow it to. Um, let's see. Romans uh, 6, 1 through 11. This, this, uh, this passage also speaks about uh, dying with Christ, that we died. His death was our death. Um, let's just read through it and make a few comments. Paul said this in Romans, right, which is a brilliant, brilliant book about the perfect finished work of Jesus Christ for us. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? We'll just move on. Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? He says you already died to sin, right? Your old Adam nature literally died. You're born again. You have a new nature. Yeah, so... Let's not live in it anymore. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Okay, what does that mean? That when you got water baptized or when you get water baptized, it's a symbol, right? And that when you go under the water, it's your burial, it's your funeral. Okay? I had a funeral 30 some years ago. How about you? <laughs> you had a funeral for yourself. Yeah, the old me is dead, buried, leave it behind. And when you come up out of the water, it's resurrection party. It's the symbol of resurrection, right? And so when you get water baptized, all you're doing is reflecting symbolically what already happened. The moment you accepted Jesus, the old you died and the new you was born. The baptism just reflects that. Go ahead. Uh, Therefore, we were buried with him in, through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Yay. Uh, for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. You, to live in resurrection life, you have to go through death, don't you? No resurrection without death. And the moment you accepted Jesus, the old you died and the new you was born. And when Jesus comes back, you get a new body and, hey, okay, go ahead. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, the old Adam nature, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Okay? For he who has died has been freed from sin. Okay? There's all kinds of stuff we could say about that, but that's, I, I want to stay on point. Now, verse 8 is very, very interesting, though. He says, now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Okay, that's true. Uh, and uh, when I was reading this passage yesterday, the Holy Spirit, you know, kind of whispered something to me. He does that. Give me a little whisper and made me laugh, actually. Um, what, he, what he said to me is, the deader you are, the aliver you are. <laughs> said that. I'm like, what? what? God's got a good sense of humor, right? So the deader you are, the aliver you are. What do you mean? The more you're dead to self, the more you're alive to Christ. Whoo. 
<laughs> so being dead or to self is a good thing. Alive or to Christ. But the more alive you are to self, conversely, the deader you are to God. The more it's about me, the less it's about God. Right? Whoa. So that works both ways. But the deader you are, well, what, how can I be deader? Because remember, still carrying around that, you know, that Adam nature that still wants to take over, right? Even though you're born again, there's still part of the, you know, we're still carrying that around. And it wants to take over and say, no, let's let it be about me. Come on, let's let it be about me. And, and Jesus said, carry your cross. Say, no, no, it's not about you. Right? It's about Jesus. Right? And, and I know from experience, mentioned it last week, I want to develop it a little bit more today. I know from experience that if you give that pride and ego to God and say, God, kill it. I'm laying it on the altar. I, I understand what it is. Kill it. Can't heal it. Kill it. Right? And when you surrender that, you begin a process. God takes you into process of literally crucifying that pride, ego, and self and literally killing it off. Even though, I mean, it's already been done, you're already born again, but, but in our way of thinking and our you know, attitudes, he takes you through a process of crucifying that and it hurts, I promise you it hurts. If you've been through it, you know it hurts. <laughs> and, and it's a good thing, it's a wonderful thing. What, how does that even work? I mentioned it last week. You, you can't crucify yourself, can you? And Jesus couldn't even crucify himself. He had to surrender himself to the process of being crucified. Right? And you do the same thing. God, I surrender pride and ego and self to the process of crucifixion. Kill it off in me. Right? Because some things you heal, some things you kill. And when you say, kill it off in me, he says, thank you. I really want to do that for you. <laughs> right? And he takes you through the process. And then um, what does that look like? Um, what does that look like? Suddenly you'll be in a situation where somebody offends you. Somebody says the wrong thing to you. They, in some way, they mistreat you or whatever. And, and now, that old pride, that old self, right, wants to rise up and say, oh, you can't say that to me. What? I'm going to, you, and, I, and, and, you know, I'll show you. Or maybe you want to run off and tell 16 other people, you know, if you're that kind of person. You know what she said to me? You know what she said to me? What is that? That's that old pride, you know, and all that, that old nature wants to take over. And, and, and you start to do that, and the Holy Spirit says, didn't you ask me to kill that? Don't do that. Deny yourself. Just come to Jesus. Just let that die right now. And you're going, oh, I really want to rise up and pop him one. No, let it die. Look at Jesus, keep your eyes on Jesus, let it die. Don't feed it, starve it, starve it, starve it. <sighs> Humble yourself, right? And, and he's cru that's crucifying, right? It's crucifying. And you're, you're literally on the cross in a sense, letting that thing die, letting God kill it. And you don't feed it, you don't defend it, you don't side with it, right? You let it die. Some things you heal, some things you kill. And when you go through that process, and it'll happen more than once, it'll happen and happen and happen until it gets easier and easier, until that thing is pretty much dead, and now it doesn't control you, right? But it's not something you just cast out and it's over and done. It's something that has to be crucified, and it's a painful process, I'm telling you. And I know from experience also that after you've gone through that process in a significant way, that you become very, very sweet. Your spirit, your nature becomes very, very sweet, and you bring peace to situations. You're a person that carries peace and releases peace. It's a beautiful thing. You carry the fragrance of Christ. If you haven't gone through that process, even as a Christian, even as a Christian who believes in Jesus going to heaven, if you haven't gone through that process, one of the things that tends to happen is you tend to do the opposite. You tend to destroy peace wherever you go. You tend to bring conflicts. There's always a storm. There's always a conflict. I'm mad at so-and-so. I'm mad at so they No, I'm not mad at them anymore. Now I'm mad at this person. And now there's always a conflict, right? And, and, and if you see that pattern developing, and, you know, and after it happens three, four, five, or 60, or 70, or 100 times, and you notice that the common factor is always you. <laughs> common, the common factor is always you. Then you know you have a pride problem as a Christian, right? 
And you can't heal it, you have to kill it. And if you don't kill it, it doesn't change. It just doesn't change. It stays with you and it makes you and everybody else miserable. But if you let God kill it, you become sweet, sweet, sweet. And uh, let's see. Uh, basically, the pride and ego, remember, is, it is um, it's satanic nature. Because that's what Lucifer did. I will establish my own throne. I will be like God. And pride and ego does the very same thing. Pride and ego says, I'm on the throne. I'm on the throne. And so pride and ego, by definition, is at war with God. <laughs> and so one of the, let me talk about symptoms, how to diagnose yourself. This is actually very helpful when I give symptoms because you can locate if you have any of these issues. One of the symptoms, if you have pride and ego running the show, is a lack of peace. You don't, you don't have peace. Because why? Because pride and ego, again, are satanic by nature, and they are at war with everything around you, and everybody and everything around you, including God. Because <laughs> pride and ego has to rule. Pride and ego is like Satan that says, everybody has to bow down to me. It's all about me. Everybody has to do what I say. Everybody has to respect me, love me, obey me, submit to me, do what I want. And if not, there's trouble. <laughs> there will be trouble. <laughs> and you don't have peace, and you're even at war with God and to, until that thing is killed and dead because you can't heal it, you have to kill it. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, I could give you like a ton of scriptures on that, but I'm not going to do that. It's okay. Uh, another another uh, symptom of pride and ego, and here's probably the biggest one, the biggest, biggest one, is that you are easily offended. <laughs> pride and ego, easily offended. And so, you know, if you notice that in yourself or you can... Probably not you, but you know, someone else you know, or somebody else you know, always getting offended. Always, you just, you have to tiptoe around them because anything you say is going to offend them, it's going to hurt their feelings somehow. And, uh, and, and there's where you typically see that combination of very deep rejection and very deep woundedness covered up by a big pride bubble, right? Because what does the pride do? It's, it's something that we put on. It's bubble wrap. It's a balloon that we put on to protect our woundedness, to protect our brokenness, to protect you know, the little guy inside that feels rejected and unloved. And so we put on the pride bubble, this bubble wrap. Uh, but pride by nature is all about me, right? And so there's that combination of deep rejection and horrible pride. And pride protects the little wounded person inside. And you'll notice that when you, um, if you have a pride issue, somebody says the wrong thing to you, and you just <laughs> offended, offended. The claws come out. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons why people going through sozo many times, if they don't get any breakthrough in healing, one of the things to look at uh, is pride, because pride protects the woundedness. Okay? It defends it. It even nurtures it. <laughs> and pride will keep you wounded the rest of your life. And one of the, one of the other symptoms of pride also is that uh, it can make you a professional victim. I'm always the victim. I'm always the victim. Because, and that pride protects that, nurtures that, defends that. But it, it defends it against enemies, but it also defends it against healing. <laughs> right, and one of the other symptoms of of pride and ego and self is that uh, you you really hate to be wrong. In fact, it's it's almost impossible for you to be wrong, <laughs> right? Because you know, pride is I'm right, I'm just right. You know, even if you think I'm wrong, I'm still right. Even if there's evidence mounting up that I'm wrong, <laughs> I'm still right. <laughs> like, <laughs> because pride is just right. I'm right. Can't be wrong. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. And if you think I'm wrong, we're at war. Because I'm right. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay, right. okay good. <laughs> One of the marks of humility, how to identify humility, is somebody who pretty easily can say, oh, maybe I'm wrong. 
Maybe I'm wrong in this situation. Let me examine myself. Let me check myself. Maybe I'm wrong. Whoa, yeah, you know what? I think I was wrong. I'm sorry. If you can do that, you got some hum humility going, right? <laughs> right? But if you just can't do I just can't do that. Can't admit I'm wrong. Can't ask for forgiveness. Can't apologize. Can't do it. Uh, huge pride. It's a problem. Uh, but, but the biggest... The biggest uh, the biggest offender, is, oh, I'm sorry, the biggest symptom is, is being easily offended. Uh, look at Matthew 11.6. I'm skipping over some other verses, but uh, yeah, Jesus said this in, in Matthew 11.6. Very, very interesting. Blessed is he who is what, not offended because of me. I, I find that verse kind of funny, actually, um, because who is Jesus? He is God. And the Bible says God is love. So Jesus is God incarnate, and if God is love, what that means is that Jesus is love incarnate. Jesus is actually love embodied, and Jesus is incapable of doing or saying anything that isn't love. Even when he destroys sin in the end, that's love. Trust me, it's, it's all love, right? Even when he destroys sin, it's love. And uh, so if Jesus is just love embodied, love incarnate, how could he possibly offend anyone? Because offense doesn't usually depend on the person, like, you know, it depends on the person who gets offended. Right? And so, who are the people that were most offended by Jesus? All the time, all the time, offended by Jesus. The, the, the Pharisees, right? The religious leaders. Because they had what? Pride. When they had pride, they were offended daily by Jesus. And when other people thought everything Jesus said was wonderful, the Pharisees were offended over over and over. Why? Because pride is offended even by perfect love. <laughs> even by someone with perfect humility. Pride gets offended. Wow, that's very interesting, isn't it? <laughs> so, and Jesus, however, even though he's love incarnate, he was a pretty straight talker, wasn't he? <laughs> right? So when Jesus knew that the Pharisees had pride issues, did he tiptoe around them? I don't want to offend you guys now. You know, No, Jesus said things like, you guys are whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. You guys are vipers. Right? He didn't he? Straight talker. Was that love? Yeah, it was. It was. It was. In their case, he was trying to wake them up. Right? He's trying to wake them up. But he doesn't tiptoe around our pride, does he? Jesus does not... <laughs> doesn't baby our pride. He actually says... Um, no, I'm offended by your pride, right? Let's kill it. You want to kill it with me? Let's kill it. And you have to say, yeah, let's do that, Lord. All right? Let's kill it. All right? I don't want to nurture it. I don't want to defend it. I want to kill it. All right? So he says, good, give it to me. I'll kill it. All, right? All you have to do is cooperate. It's going to hurt. All right? But let's kill it. Um... One more, Ephesians 4, uh, 31 and 32. Another, another symptom usually of, of pride is uh, anger, anger issues. Anybody ever had anger issues in your life? Okay, yeah, good, yeah, three of you, good, all right. So, <laughs> cool. So, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah. So Ephesians 4, 31 32 says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking... Be put away from you with all malice. He's trying to think of every synonym he can for anger because somebody might say, well, I don't really have anger. Do you have bitterness? Oh, yeah. Well, I don't really have bitterness. Do you have wrath? Well, yeah. <laughs> like, every synonym. Let's just wrap it all up together. If you have anger issues, let's get rid of it. Right? And then what does he say in verse 32? How do we do that? Uh, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So, you know, pride is, is, uh, is, is a symptom of pride is anger issues. And usually anger issues always goes back to what? Somebody hurt you way back, right? Somebody disappointed you, mistreated you, let you down, caused you to feel rejection. There's a reason for it. There's a reason for it. Uh, and again, we have the, the little wounded person inside and the big pride bubble outside protecting the wounded person. And the, the combination makes you and everybody around you miserable. <laughs> it's really not a good thing. And he says, what do you do? Kill the pride. Give it to Jesus. Let him crucify it. And then uh, be tenderhearted, forgiving, forgiving people. 
Here's, here's an interesting thing I've noticed. Um, a lot of times people will say to me, how do you forgive? I'm like, what do you mean, how do you forgive? You say, I forgive you. You just do it. You say it. No, I, I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do it. I don't know, how, I don't know how, to, how do you forgive. What they're actually saying is, it's really hard for me to forgive. And what that means is, if you're coming from a place of pride or ego, it's, it's quite literally impossible for you to forgive. Because pride and ego, by nature, do not forgive. Because pride and ego are, what, satanic nature, aren't they? They're satanic nature. They're like Lucifer himself. Is Satan the big forgiver? No, no, no. No problem, no problem. I forgive you. I for no. <laughs> Satan is not a forgiver, right? Pride and ego, by definition, are incapable of forgiving. It is not the nature. Pride and ego say, I will get even. I will show you. I will take you down. Whatever it is, right? But I don't forgive. Now, who is a forgiver? God. Right? Jesus is a forgiver. Um, that was the definition of what he did on the cross. So Jesus, by nature, God by nature, is a forgiver. And so here's the deal. Your, your spirit, your born-again spirit nature is absolutely capable of forgiving. Your born-again spirit nature, it is your nature to forgive. It absolutely is. Your pride and ego, however, do not forgive and cannot forgive. So if you're letting pride and ego run the show, you're going to have a really tough time forgiving. Right. If you're, letting, if you're partnering with your born-again nature, forgiving is what you do. It's pretty easy. So again, that's why Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. We've got to kill that thing. We've got to kill that thing. Let's kill it dead. <laughs> uh, and again, when you've gone through that process and it hurts, trust me, it hurts, and you really want, when in the middle of the process, you really want to say, stop the show, stop the show, I'm not doing this. I have to go smack that person and tell them <laughs> off. Then I'll come back and we'll start again. <laughs> and it's like Jesus getting down off the cross and, you know, and then getting back on and say, oh, it was just a timeout. <laughs> <laughs> no, stay, stay there and let it die. Let it die. Let pride die, let ego die. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Starve it to death. Let it die. It'll hurt. But uh, why, why do I have to do that? Can I just be a Christian and go to heaven without doing that? Yep, you can. Or you could be a disciple. Yeah, you could be a disciple and really go through the, the process, right, and be transformed. And after you go through that process, I absolutely guarantee you, there's a sweetness and a grace that flows through you that's supernatural, and it's nothing you did for yourself. It's purely the work of Christ now flowing through you, completely supernatural, and you go, whoa, I'm a different person. And people go, yeah, <laughs> wow, <laughs> wow. So, uh, you ready to pray? Yeah, let's, let's pray. Um, can we uh, stand together? If, uh, again, if you're comfortable standing, please do. If, if you're not physically comfortable, that's fine. But if you're fairly new with us, every, after every message, every message, we take a few minutes and invite the Holy Spirit to come and minister to people. Invite the Lord to make the, this message revelation and faith and reality in your heart have a time of transformation so Holy Spirit come now come now and just begin to breathe on us again your manifested presence you're moving and you're working come Holy Spirit work in our hearts The word become flesh. <coughs> Hallelujah. And just close your eyes again, please, and let's focus on the Lord for a few a few more moments. So if there is I know some of you are pretty new with us. If there is woundedness, rejection in your life, in your heart and soul that you've been living with. I, I really want to guarantee you, I promise you, from God's word and from experience, He is a healer.
He can and will heal that for you. If you let him. If you let him. You ask him to and allow him to. Jesus is the healer of every broken heart. Every wound, every rejection, every hurt, every disappointment, every empty place in your heart that somebody, someone that should have loved you and didn't, someone that should have valued you, protected you, cherished you, and didn't, for whatever reason, their own brokenness. But Jesus can heal and will heal. Just ask him right now. Jesus, heal my heart. Heal every broken place, every wound in me. The orphan heart, the rejection, take it out, God. Just take it out and heal me. Give me the heart of a son or a daughter, a beloved son, a beloved daughter. Fill me with your love. Heal my heart. Hallelujah. I love this because when you ask him, he just begins to pour his love into you. He just does. You may feel it, you may not. I'm, you know, that kind of varies. But he's doing it, he's doing it. Thank you, Lord. Pour your love into people's hearts. Pour your healing love. Again, take Father God. Take everyone in your embrace. Let Father God embrace you right now. Just let him take you in his arms. Again. Don't I get just one hug? No, you can get, you can get hugs from Father God all day long. Something you can really get to enjoy. Let him hug you. Let him embrace you. Let him love you, call you his own. Hallelujah. <sighs> and if you, uh, if you related to any of the symptoms of pride, if you know that's an issue to any degree in your life, Don't let pride make you and everybody else miserable. Don't let pride protect your woundedness. Just, but you can't heal that. You've got to kill it. So just tell him, Jesus, kill it for me. Kill pride, ego, self. I surrender it. I lay it down. Take it, Jesus. Kill it. Kill it. We're going to starve it, going to deny it, and take up my cross and follow you. I need to keep my eyes on you, Jesus. I want to be a disciple. I want to be a, a real disciple, a real follower. I want to be transformed. Just whisper it to him, Jesus, make me a real disciple. I want to be transformed. Do surgery in me. Kill what needs to be killed and heal what needs to be healed. Jesus, do your amazing miracle work in my heart and in my soul. Take, take my broken life and make it beautiful. Take my broken heart and soul and make it beautiful. moment last night where I just felt the urge to the leading to 
kneel before, before the Lord. I'm going to do that. Can we, it's, you're welcome to join me or not. It's not a test. It's really not. I just I, I want to kneel before God. You have the, that's something you want to join me. That's great. If you're not physically comfortable doing that, I understand. It's really okay. 